Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this forum on evaluating the relationship between MIT and the Saudi monarchy. Uh, it's sponsored by the MIT faculty newsletter and MIT Radius. My name is Balakrishnan Rajagopal. I teach in the Department of Urban Planning. I'm stepping in for Sally Haslanger, who's uh, somewhere here, um, who uh, could not attend as a chair of this panel. So uh, as you know, the context <coughs> for this is that after the killing, uh, the, the horrific death of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, MIT President Rafael Raif asked for an internal evaluation of uh, MIT's relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. Ongoing and planned relationship uh, exists, including uh, uh, those agreements that were highlighted uh, during a campus visit by a delegation led by Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who met with the MIT leadership in March. Uh, a draft report uh, has been prepared by uh, uh, Richard Lester, uh, the associate provost, and has been circulated, as I understand, um, the, which gives a preliminary wow. sense of where the relationship should go. Um, although we haven't had time to read and digest the report in its entirety, I, I'm sure that it will come up during the discussion, at least. For this panel, we uh, at least I'd like to ask several questions you know, um, and um, I mean, first question is, what's Saudi Arabia's human rights record uh, and um, uh, how is the U.S. implicated with it? Has it been a surprise that when Khashoggi's death happened, we all woke up and realized that it was a bad regime? Um, secondly, should MIT have a relationship uh, with entities related to or controlled by uh, you know, regimes like Saudi Arabia uh, or other entities, is it ethical? Are there boundaries? If so, who polices the boundaries? Uh, thirdly, uh, by extension, uh, what about the relationship beyond Saudi Arabia with uh, other countries or regimes or other entities, for that matter, companies, or uh, anyone who has a terrible uh, record in terms of ethics and human rights? Um, what process exists? Um, to, uh, uh, to prevent this from happening? And how can MIT, which is the final question, prevent getting engaged with uh, entities like this? Um, is there a need for, uh, for to think about a, a proper or better process, as well as uh, perhaps think about uh, some sort of broader conversation about uh, ethics? Not ethics in the narrower sense of research ethics, which, of course, we always talk about. But in terms of, uh, more in terms of what I would call as ethics of engagement. Um, so I think it's a question that has both historical as well as contemporary relevance. And there are many people on the panel who can speak about all of these issues uh, very competently. So the way we are going to structure this is that uh, I'm first going to ask a few questions to our first speaker. Uh, with whom I will kind of have a dialogue back and forth. Uh, she's uh, Sarah uh, uh, Leah Whitson, who is uh, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, Middle East and North Africa Division. Um, and once we have this little uh, chat about uh, Saudi Arabia and its human rights record and how it matters, um, uh, and um, uh, after that, we will uh, basically um, turn to the rest of the panelists. I will briefly mention their names and their affiliations. Uh, and they will briefly address uh, this uh, gathering in terms of uh, what they think are the main issues to think about when it comes to the engagement between MIT and Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, we have Nicholas Dumas, a PhD candidate in political science from MIT. Uh, Professor Jonathan King from Department of Biology. Uh, Professor Sheldon Krimsky from uh, Tufts University. Uh, and uh, we have Lucas Walters, PhD candidate in political science from MIT as well. So with that, uh, let's have a chat. So um, do you want to come up here? I can yeah. sit and dialogue. Mm -hmm. It might be better. Yeah, no, come up here. So OK. Let me just, yeah. I'd be the guy to sit All right. Um, I mean, were people were really surprised when Khashoggi affair happened, or 
as someone who's been watching human rights in Saudi Arabia, did it come as new news for you? How, how would you assess the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia? Has it always been bad or is things are getting worse mm -hmm. or how? And particularly, you know, relatedly, when I talk about, when I say human rights, I'm not just talking about what happens to Saudi citizens within country or like Khashoggi, Saudi citizen who is outside, but bad stuff happens to him. But also Saudi's, Saudi regime's involvement in Yemen, mm -hmm. in the war, so. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi inside the confines of the Saudi consulate in Istanbul was definitely a shock and a surprise. Uh, because I don't think uh, any of us, and obviously not even Jamal, uh, anticipated uh, the brazen and stupid act uh, that they dared to carry out in their own embassy, complete with someone arriving there to dress like him so that they think they could pretend that they could get away with saying that he, in fact, marched out the embassy um, with a lookalike. Um, so I think the specific manner in which this uh, murder uh, took place in the Saudi consulate was definitely a surprise. Um, and uh, uh, that being said, I should say that had I known that Jamal was planning to go into the consulate that day by himself, I would have advised him not to do that. Um, because what we also know is that the Saudi government has, uh, particularly in the last few years, been carrying out a campaign of harassment, intimidation, attack, abduction, uh, uh, kidnapping, uh, and uh, even a reported killing of Saudis uh, uh, who are abroad, who are either abroad as political dissidents, who are abroad just because they didn't want to be involved in the political system there, um, but who, for whatever reasons, were identified as threats uh, to the uh, current uh, uh, ruling crown prince. Um, and so we have a number of princes who were abducted, kidnapped, returned to Saudi Arabia um, uh, from Europe. Um, we have a number of Saudi women uh, who tried to flee abusive family situations and were literally detained and kidnapped and brought back forcibly uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, we have activists, journalists, writers outside Saudi Arabia uh, who've received death threats, who've been surveilled, uh, uh, whose families have been threatened, detained, jailed inside Saudi Arabia as punishment for, uh, for their speaking. Um, so I have no doubt in my mind that, that the current Saudi government wishes that they could kill all of these people if they could only get away with it. The only surprise element here was that they thought so stupidly that they could get away with this. Uh, and clearly it's blown up in their face far worse than they ever anticipated. Um, in terms of the broader human rights situation in Saudi Arabia, uh, obviously for anyone who follows Saudi Arabia, the human rights situation with respect to civil and political rights in particular in the kingdom has always been bad. Um, and anyone with an independent critical voice in the kingdom has always faced jailing, persecution, arrest, uh, and so forth. There is no independent civil society. There, are, there is no independent press uh, in Saudi Arabia. And those few uh, voices of human rights activists and reformists who, during the uprisings in 2011 that spread throughout the Middle East, who dare to propose a constitutional reform to have a constitutional monarchy in Saudi Arabia uh, have all been jailed, and their lawyers have all been jailed along with them. So repression has been a long-standing reality. What's different about the current uh, uh, leadership in Saudi Arabia, by which I mean specifically Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, is the broadening and ex ex extension of repression abuse and intolerance toward a much broader swath of society. So now people who will find themselves arbitrarily detained and arrested, potentially tortured or abused, are not just, you know, let's say fringe outliers who are calling for human rights reforms, um, but anyone advocating for anything and doing so publicly. And so, for example, uh, uh, women's rights activists um, who campaigned for the right to drive, which obviously the Crown Prince supported by ending the ban on women driving, have been jailed uh, and tortured uh, and even sexually abused uh, in, in prison. And this is happening now um, because uh, the new uh, uh, government in Saudi Arabia, the Crown Prince, does not tolerate any independent voices in the country. 
And so last year, about 350 of the country's leading uh, business uh, figures, media figures, not people who criticized or were critical of the government, but people who had independent sources of power uh, in the country because they are leading media establishments, because they are leading business figures, because they are leading religious scholars, either more conservative uh, or, or, or extremist or reformist, they were all uh, uh, detained, uh, arbitrarily detained. Um, the business people among them forced to uh, give up, uh, in some cases, 90% of their assets or wealth without ever seeing a judge or having any kind of a process. Uh, many clerics now jailed. So what's been different is the extreme concentration of power in the hands of just the crown prince, um, which is very much not in the tradition of how the Saudi ruling family has traditionally led for the past several decades, which has in fact relied on not just sticks, but the carrots of support from the business establishment, from the religious establishment, uh, as pillars of uh, uh, the strength of the Saudi ruling family. And one of the reasons why historically it has been so conservative and slow is because it has ruled by its own brand of consensus. That doesn't exist now. So that is uh, one dramatically different thing. The other dramatically different thing is, of course, the war in Yemen, uh, which was started uh, under the rule of the new crown prince, who is also, by the way, the minister of defense, even though he's uh, never served in any army and, to our knowledge, has zero military experience, but yet decided that he must start a war uh, in Yemen uh, to dislodge um, uh, the Houthis, who had taken control uh, of the government in a coup uh, in the country. And now, uh, while promised to be a war that would last a few months, I remember I actually addressed the MIT community here when that war was just starting, warning that it wasn't gonna go away anytime soon. And now I think, lo and behold, three years later, we see it is uh, a, a tremendous, unbelievable man-made catastrophe where the UN has just announced uh, uh, conditions of famine in the country, uh, where indiscriminate bombardment uh, uh, and the siege uh, have resulted in uh, uh, catastrophe uh, for the people of Yemen um, with no military gains. The Houthis remain in power uh, in large chunks of the country. And ironically, the government on whose behalf Saudi Arabia was purportedly fighting uh, uh, to restore has actually condemned Saudi actions uh, and called them occupiers uh, in their country. So it's become very complicated. Um, but the scale of the violations of humanitarian law, um, we have concluded uh, amount in many cases to war crimes. Uh, and the deliberate systematic uh, nature of uh, the repeated uh, indiscriminate attacks on civilians as well as the siege uh, uh, rise to the you know, gravest level of violations, including crimes against humanity. It's interesting that uh, the way you're describing it, uh, things have actually gotten much worse under the Crown Prince's rule recently. Because you know, for those of us who don't follow Saudi Arabia on a day-to-day -day basis, exactly the opposite impression has been conveyed in recent press coverage in the West, which is that he's the liberalizer and the moderate guy who is modernizing and allowing women to drive and you know things are essentially going to go in the right direction and that's partly the atmosphere in which he came to campus here in march you know the idea was that if you can kind of make a deal with somebody who is a relative moderate among the rest of them which are all who are all hardliners things will improve but you you are giving a very different kind of uh picture so my second question to you is are is America simply unaware, or didn't American government know more than, for example, the kind of things that you're talking about? And didn't, I mean, is America responsible for some of this, about what's going on both within as well as, uh, you know, the war in Yemen and so on? Um, well, uh, you know, just sort of a multi-part, multi-prong question. But with respect to the war in Yemen, um, the American support and participation in the war in Yemen, uh, and we uh, 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 believe that the US is a party to the war in Yemen. It's not just selling arms, which is all that the UK is doing, for example. The United States is actually a party to the war um, because it has provided refueling support until very recently uh, to uh, uh, Saudi 
coalition aircraft. Uh, it has provided intelligence uh, assistance uh, since the, the start of the war. Um, so it's actively an active participant in the war. It has war planners and war advisors sitting in Riyadh giving uh, guidance to the war teams uh, and so forth. And therefore, we have warned the US government that they face complicity in these very same war crimes that we are uh, accusing the Saudi coalition of carrying out. Um, Certainly, uh, the Obama administration, uh, when it uh, entered into this war, uh, uh, did so on the basis of a willful blindness that this would be over in a couple of months. Uh, if for those of you who follow the matter closely, you'll see many in the Obama administration now putting out um, limited forms of mea culpas, uh, 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 regretting their involvement in this war, which I think a number of them have conceded had nothing to do with the merits of fighting a war in Yemen and everything to do with consoling Saudi Arabia for the Iran nuclear deal, you know, in order to retain and reassure the ally Saudi Arabia um, that we weren't about to actually be real friends with Iran. It was just a, 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 a deal on, on containing nuclear development they had to support them in the war uh, in Yemen. So as I've said, the, the war in Yemen, the, 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 the nuclear deal with Iran was literally paid for uh, by Yemeni civilians. They are the ones who are paying the bill. Not anyone in the US, not anyone in Saudi Arabia, not anyone in Iran either. Um, but, I, I, but I think very soon as, as months turned you know, into years, people within the State Department uh, uh, and, and broadly Congress started questioning the war questioning the devastation it was causing, questioning the role of the US government in the war. And even during the Obama administration, there was a vote in the Senate that came very close to suspending arms sales to Saudi Arabia, narrowly defeated in the Senate, but never before you know, seen that kind of a strong consensus of Republican and Democratic voices saying they wanted to stop the arms shipments to Saudi Arabia. And you know, Obama did stop sending some guided missiles. There was a suspension of transfers of cluster munitions. So there were some limited little pullbacks uh, uh, from the war effort. Um, that all dramatically changed with the election of President Trump, who, of course, first visit was to Saudi Arabia, the big fanfare surrounding the declaration of a $100 billion arms deal. Um, I believe that actually very few contracts have actually been signed, has been reported in the media. But those considerations were very publicly, pronouncedly rejected. And President uh, uh, Trump has repeatedly said, this is important to the US because these arms deals create jobs in the US, p period, end of story. And at some level, you know, it's, it's, um, it's nice to have the mask come off a little bit and to have someone speaking directly about what the priorities are rather than having a president who wouldn't say that but was doing many of the same things under President Obama and the war in Yemen. So there is a, a, a something to be appreciated in transparency. Um, and I think it has actually managed to uh, miraculously create the only real bipartisan action we've seen in the US Congress since Trump's election, which was the recent vote in the Senate uh, to end the war in Yemen uh, and to suspend arms transfers to Saudi Arabia. That has passed committee and now it will go for a broader vote. Um, but you know, if you had said to me two years ago or three years ago that the Senate would take this measure, Republicans and Democrats, I would have said no way. And you know, I think part of that bill is being paid for, was paid for by the blood of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, so his death is not entirely in vain. Um, but it has in an odd way forced our Senate to step up and take responsibility uh, for this. And so there is room for, for hope uh, in that regard. Um, there were some other questions you had. I don't know if I addressed them all, I'm sorry. It was a multi-part question. <laughs> well, it's more about the surprise that people had because there was this idea that the oh, prince was the a MBS modernizer. Oh, the MBS in his PR tour show, right. So, you know, at the time when, when MBS was embarking on the PR tour, I mean, it was, I'm not calling it a PR tour. This is they hired PR agents and PR firms. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars. They plastered MBS's face all over London buses and London streets when he was in London. People were laughing like, what? Um, but it was obviously a, a very deliberate campaign to um, 
uh, normalize and introduce the crown prince um, because his ascendancy as crown prince uh, was not an obvious choice and wasn't a, 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 a you know, apparent conclusion. There was a power struggle in Saudi Arabia. Um, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Naif was deposed, uh, and he was uh, brought into power. Now, we have to understand Mohammed bin Naif was the Saudi leader who had decades of work in the interior ministry, decades of relationships with the CIA, the State Department, the Department of Defense, and was the person that the US government saw as their partner in Saudi Arabia. So when he was summarily removed uh, through the maneuvering of uh, 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 Mohammed bin Zayed in, in the UAE uh, and, and pushed into uh, uh, his role as crown prince, he had to be you know, gently rolled out in the United States for not just the public audience who didn't know him, but a security establishment who didn't know him and a government who didn't know him or trust him and so forth. And the marketing strategy was that he would sell himself as the reformer. Uh, and certainly he, you know, as part of McKinsey's Vision 2030 plan for Saudi Arabia, there was a very ambitious plan to uh, privatize the economy with the sale of Aramco uh, uh, liberalize the public spaces, um, like having movie theaters or stadiums, still segregated, um, and also, you know, the, the 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 promise that's been dangling for 20 years of allowing women to drive, and ironically, it has been Mohammed bin Salman's concentration of power, elimination of the other pillars of the Saudi establishment, particularly the religious establishment. He basically called the bluff of his country's religious establishment, who had said, you can't do these changes, you can't make reforms in Saudi Arabia because we will oppose them and you need us for your legitimacy and, and lasting. He called their bluff. He said, actually, I can put you all in jail, I can make these reforms, and nothing's gonna happen. And I think it's because he had his finger on the pulse of the youth. Um, the, I think over 50% of the population of Saudi Arabia is under the age of 21, um, and as a young person himself, understood that not allowing women to drive, not having movie theaters, uh, uh, not having stadiums where there could be cultural events was out of touch with what the vast majority of the Saudi public namely the youth, wanted. So I think that explains some of these uh, good, positive changes uh, in Saudi Arabia. But I think we need to be careful not to confuse that with liberal in the way that, that many of us may understand the word liberal, um, which means um, uh, tolerant of free thinking, broad ideas, differences of views, differences of opinions, that they have a space to coexist. So. Uh, someone who believes in, in a greater public space and, and even greater rights for women, um, which I do believe he supports, is not necessarily someone who believes in free speech or someone who believes that women should have the right to express themselves or speak freely. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated narrative to explain. Okay. Great. Uh, just one uh, final question, and then we'll turn to the rest of the panelists. So what can anyone do about regimes like uh, Saudi Arabia? Um, uh, do you focus only on those who, again, some, some evidence exists, like the kill team members who went to Istanbul, some of whom have been identified, or the prince himself, or any particular individuals, or is the regime as a whole to be held responsible and I understand recently Human Rights Watch has uh, filed uh, a legal action in Argentina, and Argentinian prosecutors are asking for information on the war in Yemen. Is that one way of going about it, or uh, is, is, I mean, what can be done about this sort of thing? I mean, and also, by the way, on the U.S. side, mm -hmm. is it enough to just, uh, for, to cut off the arms supply, then can we just, uh, you know, take the view that hey, you know, we have done everything we can, and whatever happens to the Saudis is no longer our problem. Um, you know, when, what can be done, you know, the, the answer depends on who is the actor, um, what is their purpose, what is their responsibility. Um, and I'm not one of those people with the view that certainly the U.S. government has to fix everything that's wrong uh, in the world, certainly not in the Middle East, 
please, no, please, no, 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 don't, don't do that. We saw what happened in Iraq. We saw what happened in Libya. You know, it's, it's not a reliable counterparty to fix things. I think the, the, the ask that I would make of anyone, whether it's the U.S. government, whether it's MIT, uh, uh, whether it's myself, is do no harm. You know, make sure that your own actions, your own policies, don't contribute to harm. Now, with respect to Saudi Arabia, the harm, very specifically, obviously, that the U.S. is contributing to and is participating in is the war in Yemen um, because of the manner in which that war has been fought. And that's why we have persistently called on the U.S. not only uh, to end uh, its supplies of weapons, uh, but to end its role in this war because of the ongoing violations of human rights and international law. Um, you know, with respect to, and I think this is the question you are discussing here today, you know, the, the role and responsibility of an academic institution, I would probably think that it's similar to the responsibilities that we expect businesses uh, uh, to follow, um, which is to recognize that you have human rights responsibilities, that you are responsible uh, for actions or policies that contribute to human rights abuses um, or benefit from human rights abuses. And so in certain contexts, for example, Israeli settlements, we have said to businesses, you should not operate in or with settlements um, because there is no way for your actions, policies, businesses there not to contribute to human rights abuses or to benefit from human rights abuses because everything that's happening in the settlements is built fundamentally on the abuse of the Palestinians there. And so I would expect that with respect, I mean, with respect to any government with whom this university or any university is transacting is first of all to know the facts, to do the due diligence, to understand the extent, breadth, severity of the human rights abuses and the, the laws of war uh, violations, and then to you know, honestly examine the extent to which your engagement, interaction, and I, I don't know the facts or details, but I'm guessing that it is mostly transactional by way of money from the Saudi Arabian government coming to this institution. I'm guessing it's not the other way around. Um, and you know, understand where those monies are coming from, who's providing the funding, and what the sources are. And certainly there should be a distinction made um, between government entities, um, and non-governmental entities, um, since we can't expect non-governmental entities to be responsible for the behavior of the government. Um, and you know, truly examine what, what, what the role and purpose is of that uh, government entity and, and whether, for example, you are contributing to uh, the human rights abuses. You know, does giving them a polished reputation as being seen as a lover of academic science, growth, and freedom um, is that contributing to harm? Maybe, you know, that's really a, a comfort level that people have to uh, examine because no one's making you do this. It's a decision that the community has to take uh, on its own. Thank you, I think that's a good moment to, to turn to the other speakers. So we just go down the list in the order in which speakers are listed. So now I'm gonna to turn to Nicholas Dumas. PhD uh, student, candidate in political science. Uh, you co-authored a piece in the tech, which kind of laid out some of your concerns and objections. So. Thank you, I'm uh, fighting a bit of a cold, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, my name is Nicholas Duma. I'm one of several graduate students uh, who was involved in an effort uh, to, uh, unsuccessfully, clearly, to get uh, persuade uh, MIT to end its partnership with the government of Saudi Arabia and with uh, Saudi government-controlled uh, entities. I think there's a lot to be said about uh, this partnership and about uh, the government of Saudi Arabia and specifically about uh, the regime of Mohammed bin Salman. Hopefully, uh, this will get significant coverage. But I think one point that I want to start by making is that I think MIT is one of the greatest liberal institutions in the world. And I think it is one of the greatest accomplishments 
of sort of post-Enlightenment thinking in the world. And I think you have to look no farther than the Infinite Corridor, where at any given point in time, you walk down and you see people from every walk of life, sexuality, gender identity, from all over the world, working together, collaborating uh, to move the world forward. And I think we live in a time when that view of humanity is particularly in danger. Right? I think all over the world, it seems like these sort of forces of illiberalism seem to be on the rise. And I think it's particularly important that we be vigilant about not just not doing harm ourselves, but not helping bad people do harm. And I think there is no question that the government of Saudi Arabia is, in fact, one of the most grotesque, murderous regimes on the planet. In fact, it's actually hard for them to like, do more harm. If you go through the list of all the different types of human rights violations, it's like a, it's like a bingo. Um, and so I think, at least in my view, and I think in the view of many other graduate students who have been involved in this initiative, the decision uh, shouldn't be actually a difficult one. We recognize that sometimes universities have to make tough calls about donors, and you know not everyone's perfect. But there's an enormous chasm between an imperfect donor uh, and a government that routinely uh, starves children to death, bombs children, tortures and executes gays, uh, forces women uh, uh, to be the, uh, the subject of, of their husbands and fathers, and so on and so forth, and the list continues. The last point I'll make is that if you were only to pay attention to what MIT has said about the government of Saudi Arabia, you would think that you know, Mohammed bin Salman is this sort of cool, progressive, like gender egalitarian person. He's investing in vaccine research and supporting women scientists. And I think that that is clearly wrong and it is clearly harmful. And so you know, my, my view, and I think the view of many other graduate students, uh, is that no, it's first of all not acceptable to have any sort of business partnership with the government of Saudi Arabia or with uh, Saudi uh, government controlled entities. And it's also not acceptable co to continue putting forward this message that whitewashes the horrific crimes that this government has continued and in fact has escalated. So for, for those reasons, uh, I'm strongly of the view that, that this partnership is a significant mistake. Thank you. I think as we uh, go further, we may need to unpack a little bit about what exactly is government controlled. Uh, Aramco, for example, is of course a state-owned company, uh, but then we also have, uh, you know, is our state universities, yeah, uh, we, which, with which we do have relationships, and are they also extensions of the state? In which case, there is a problem. Uh, if you draw a very sharp distinction between public and private, and you know, allow only relationship with purely private actors, entrepreneurs, who have no relationship with the government whatsoever. Is that where we should be driving? Well, I mean, so one point that I think it's, it's really important to make in which we emphasized in our interactions with MIT, right, is that you know, our, our concerns are with the government of, of Saudi Arabia and with Mohammed bin Salman. Our concerns are not, as you point out, with sort of the people of Saudi Arabia. In fact, many people uh, of the graduate students who are involved in this initiative are people who are from sort of countries with governments that have committed any number of human rights violations. You know, my, my family um, immigrated from Iran, and so you know, we're, we're sort of sensitive to uh, sort of the bind that, that, um, that people can be put into. So I, th I think in this case, it is important to draw a distinction between sort of entities that are majority controlled by the Saudi government and uh, entities and, and groups that are not. Right? I think in this case, sort of the, uh, given especially that, uh, Saudi Arabia is a sort of theocratic autocracy. Uh, the decision for, uh, by you know, Aramco to partner with MIT was approved by Mohammed bin Salman, right? It's part of this PR campaign. The idea that this is sort of this independent uh, thing that happened is, is clearly not the case. There may be issues, you know, certain cases that are sort of on, you know, marginal and, and unclear, and I'm happy to give MIT the benefit of the doubt in making those determinations. Uh, but I think there are plenty of examples and plenty of partnerships where it's very clearly uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, and, and that regime that's it, uh, in the, the driving chair. Okay. Um, so the, uh, next uh, is uh, Jonathan King, um, who can give us, I think, uh, 
Some context, some, some, some historical Little understanding. MIT history. Yes. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, as we've heard, though, MIT is a private university. Technically, a large fraction of its operating budget comes from the federal government, that is, from the taxpayers. So this is a public entity. It's really a national entity. Thus, in addition to carrying out educational research missions with respect to undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, there's a broader responsibility to the nation as a whole here. Now, uh, what some of us uh, are struggling with is how do we proceed as faculty if there are indications uh, that uh, the agreements between MIT and the Saudi monarch violate MIT's basic mission and, and, and spirit. So I want to just review it. There's a little bit of history on that. It's not, not that much, but, it, but it's useful. Uh, I'll give you three cases. During the growth of the movement against the war in Vietnam, MIT was a national center of resistance of the scientific community. Uh, the 19, March 1979 scientists strike for peace. Most of you are too young to know that that happened here. There was a day, a strike at MIT. It was copied by campuses around the country. Um, and uh, one of the things that emerged at that time was the presence of the instrumentation lab, which is now called the Charles Stark Draper Lab, as, as, a, as a campus entity. And the instrumentation lab had uh, military contracts having to do with missile guidance and new su submarines and recruited uh, faculty and students to work on it. Now, since these programs were predominantly military secrets, they couldn't be discussed with colleagues, right? So that interferes fundamentally with this basic character of a great research university that there's open exchange. Everybody wants to tell you what they're doing, you're exchanging ideas. So uh, as the war intensified in Vietnam, agitation at home here at MIT to, div MIT to divest from this so-called iLab uh, grew. Uh, there was a, quite a large group of students that were called the Student Action Coordinating Committee. On November 5th of that year, 350 MIT students marched on the iLab called Shut It Down. And the police call were called out, and dogs and lots of them were arrested. Uh, President Johnson took out a restraining order against the students um, protesting at MIT. Uh, however, uh, the uh, concern didn't die down, and in May 1970, President Johnson responded to the pressure and announced that MIT was divesting from the laboratory, and now it stands as a, you know, it's still there as a free living uh, agency, figuring out how to you know, put a mos missile on Berkeley or Moscow or wherever. Uh, but nonetheless, that, that was important because it gave a little room here internally at MIT, for example, to criticize the military budget, which you couldn't do uh, prior to that. Second case, a little similar to this, uh, involves MIT and the then Shah of Iran. This was before the revolution that overthrew the, the Shah. Uh, 1975, uh, MIT's nuclear engineering department uh, cut a deal with the Shah of Iran. The nuclear engineering department would take 50 students from Iran, train them to be nuclear engineers for some, at that time, large sum of money. That's very different from the Shah of Iran making scholarships available to those students from Iran who could apply and get in. That would have been acceptable. That, that followed the norms of academic procedure. No, this was a package deal. We'll give you so many millions, you take these 50 students. The issue was intensely debated at faculty meetings and among students. An ad hoc faculty committee uh, was established to look into the issues raised. Students had their own committee. They voted uh, against this program. The faculty voted for it. I remember this vividly. I've been here a long time. I was one of the faculty who voted against it. But it, it carried. It's clear that the majority of the faculty at that time was still in the Cold War period. Uh, thought this was fine. In 1979, when the Shah's absolutist regime was overthrown, there were still a dozen Iranian students in the nuclear engineering program. There's a lot of ironic things about then. The, of course, it was some of those students trained under the Shah that ended up being part of the modern Iranian nuclear program. Uh, the, uh, the third example is the apartheid debate. Um, during when the apartheid regime was still in place in South Africa, 
MIT faculty, students, and staff, a group of them formed the Coalition Against Apartheid. They called for divestment for MIT's endowment to divest from companies doing business with apartheid South Africa. This was a national movement that was going on in campuses across the country. This group was a very energetic group. They built a shanty town uh, on campus. They had marches, they had demonstrations. Uh, it, it was a big issue. Paul Gray was at the helm. He steadfast president, he steadfastly resisted the divestment call, and he also refused to set up a faculty committee. He kept it, it was under the corporation, right? That was the endowment. Faculty don't have any control over the, the, the investment. And in a letter, April 3rd, 1990, he announced, nope, we are not going to divest from the apartheid government. Um, that, uh, some of the national leadership in that movement came from black chemists at Polaroid on Main Street. And I will tell you, that decision by Paul Gray, that was a black eye, you know, a black mark on, on MIT's reputation. And many people, you know, had second thoughts about well, what, what is going on at this, this place. Uh, when the apartheid government finally fell in the early 1990s, Nelson Mandela was elected, the issue became moot, so it disappeared because uh, the government had fallen. So uh, we clearly need to, um, I'll close, uh, we need to be very careful, as everybody has said. We sh you know, the Nazis uh, developed some wonderful youth programs, right, while they were burning the Jews to death in the concentration camps, right? So um, Sarah's point uh, about the fact that uh, he's opening theaters, no, that, that's not a measure of, you know, uh, the, the democracy. I want to close. Uh, today I learned... Um, I got a call from a reporter saying that MIT had a, issued uh, a report on this, uh, Richard Lester. We had invited him to the forum. He, he declined. We asked him to send, well, send some other representation of the administration. They declined. It's interesting. It comes out the day of this forum. Uh, anyway, I didn't see the report, but the reporter called me, told me he issued. The reporter sent it to me. Uh, so it's, I just want to say, it's a report from Richard Lester, one person. It's not from a committee of the faculty. It's not from the committee of the institute. He says he talked to lots of faculty. None of them are named, right? This situation needs some kind of independent body that doesn't have representatives of the administration sitting on it to look at this situation and report to our community. What do we think? Richard Lester says, Fine to do business with these people because, in the end, you know it's it's, it's better than not. Um, so this is not the end of the process; uh, it's it's the beginning. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Krimsky, Sheldon Krimsky. So um, I've been studying uh, external funding for universities for about 35 years, and I've learned a few things that I can share with you. Uh, and some of them relate to the situation you have here. <clears throat> Firstly, on the corporate funding of science, uh, it often comes with expectations. I coined the term funding effect which describes the research finding that corporate funding of research tends to yield results that support the corporate economic interest. And there's good data that shows this in the pharmaceutical industry, in the chemical industry, and more recently in the energy and oil companies. Uh, it raises questions about whether or not funding from Saudi companies that have any relationship to oil would have a particular interest in certain types of funding or certain types of activities at MIT to protect the oil interests of the country. Point number two, 
Foundations also fund universities with special interests. Uh, the Koch Foundation uh, funded economics professors at Florida State University. I happened to see the contract. <laughs> I was absolutely appalled. They not only wanted to pick the economics professor, but they were gonna monitor the whole curriculum of the professor. And if they didn't feel that the curriculum was as they wished it, they would have the right to dismiss the professor. I wrote a commentary in Nature, which they published, and um, I'm not sure what the outcome was. Um, it, was in a, it was the first time I've seen a contract with such an explicit control over academic governance by a foundation. Tufts was funded by the Confucius Foundation, is still funded by it. There's many hundreds of universities that are funded by that. Uh, it's a Chinese funding operation and presumably uh, supports various student activities, but underlying it is a propaganda function that many universities accept. One of the um, representatives, uh, congressional representatives here in Massachusetts has asked that Tufts end their funding from the Confucius Foundation because the money comes with tainted activities. Foreign money to a private university is vulnerable for all sorts of abuses. Uh, I was able to see the contracts from Florida State uh, and Berkeley when they received funding from Koch and Novartis because they're public universities. U.S. foundations are somewhat transparent, so you get to know, you know, who the main characters are, what, what they've done, whether they're racist, whether they've come out as homophobic. You know, you, 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 get, you, get some act, you get to understand something about these foundations. And, and plus, uh, their um, budgets are often uh, public, uh, you know, open to public uh, review. But private universities and foreign governments, well, that's a recipe for secrecy. No control over what the foreign government does. And the private university, they haven't published the contracts. And you, I, I couldn't get copies of the contracts. Um, I developed, at one point, an ethical framework for universities to examine external funding called When Sponsored Research Fails the Admissions Test. And, you know, because, you know, how far back in history do you go? I mean, Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, and, and what activities are you going to exclude? So, I mean, I, the first tier I had was universal principles that every university, and I'm pleased to say that a couple of them were cited by uh, Richard Lester. They wouldn't accept a contract where the control over publication was defined by the funder. And yet we've seen that. Universities do accept uh, contracts with all kinds of clauses that allow the funder to control the, um, you know, what comes out of the research. So I'm pleased to say, now there's a few principles that I call universal. And then there are the others. Uh, the School of Public Health at Harvard will not accept any tobacco money. That's a choice that that school made with faculty input and governance. Some schools will not accept funding from an organization that, that is anti-Semitic or fascist. And there are foundations that meet those criteria or homophobic. And that's appropriate. But it should be done with faculty governance because on one hand, the university says we have faculty autonomy, we're supposed to go out and get research funds. Uh, and, you know, we should be allowed to get research funds from anybody we want to, with the exception of the universal principles. But then, what if the people wanting to fund us have these other qualities that are inconsistent with values at the university? That's when faculty governments kicks in. 
So Tufts University, for example, will not accept funding for weapons systems. You know, so we had a big debate when Star Wars come out, was that a weapons system or not? That was the big debate. And we just had a faculty uh, vote on whether we would divest uh, any funding from assault weapons. Uh, so we pushed the university to tell us whether they have any investments in assault weapons. So those are the kinds of things that faculty governance can do. Uh, and this whole idea of the faculty autonomy, take any funding you can get versus university values, no funding that conflicts with university values, that's where those two meet. Um, so I think MIT has an opportunity now, first of all, to make transparent what these funding agreements are about. Do they violate some of the higher principles or some of the secondary principles that MIT doesn't want to be involved in? I mean, supposing some of the funding is antithetical to climate change. Well, you know, do you want to fund uh, you know, an organization that is trying to subvert the whole idea of reacting to climate change? That's something the university should know about. So I think there's plenty to do, but I think you need to have some transparency before you can move forward, find out what these organizations are that uh, fund um, MIT, what they're about, what they're made of, what their values are, and then you can decide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really useful, um, given us a lot to think about. Finally, we have uh, Lucas Walters, PhD candidate in political science, who also co-authored that uh, article in the tech. Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I think much has, has already been said and has, has said, you know, it's been said much more eloquently than, than I ever could in English, but I'm going to so just re-emphasize a few points, I think, um, that we, sorry, that, that we wanted to make when we, when we wrote that, that letter. Um, I think um, the first is that, that uh, sort of MIT and its reactions currently in the report and, and, and back in March when, it, when a different group of students sort of wrote for the first time and, and, and published a letter in the, in the tech criticizing the visit of, of Bin Salman to campus has, so the reaction of the, the administration has been to emphasize, you know, the good that comes out of the collaboration and I think that, that that's correct. Um, you know, the, they're great projects and, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we have money to fund, to fund that kind of research. Um, but, it, but it seems like people underestimate maybe ignore but probably underestimate the, the harm that, 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 that can be done when we collaborate or when MIT collaborates with these regimes. Um, MIT is, is one of America's premier educational institutions. Like the brand of MIT is incredibly valuable and MIT knows that, right? Um, MIT is very strict about, has, has very strict policies about who can use their logos, who can say that they're associated with MIT, who can put <laughs> the little MIT emblem on, 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 on their own website, et cetera, so they know how valuable it is. And so they should really consider what happens when they allow other people to say they're working with MIT, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're partnering with MIT, et cetera. Because what they're doing is they're normalizing they're normalizing those people, right? MIT is partnering with Facebook and Google, and then also the Saudi regime. That all of a sudden makes it sound like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's just w w one other partner. Um, and that doesn't seem to be, to factor into the administration's considerations to, to, to the amount that, that it should. Um, I think a, a, a second thing is that um, in their response, they tend to stress, you know, MIT's values as, you know, we're this community of curious researchers and, you know, we like rigorous scientific inquiry and, and sort of collaborating with uh, Saudi universities and using the money for projects is, you know, that's, that's aligned with that. And I think um, here we're forgetting that, you know, yeah, sure, we're all rigorous researchers, but first and foremost, we're sort of like, we're, we're very open, you know, um, inclusive, a respectful community of researchers. And I think in part, you know, MIT is great because we are an open and inclusive community of researchers. So part of our values are also that openness and, you know, respect for human dignity and, you know, non-discrimination. So these are also, you know, core parts of, 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 of MIT's values. And obviously the Saudi regime is, um, 
is incredibly at odds with all of that. And so it's, uh, it's surprising to shocking that we haven't heard any, like from the beginning of the collaboration with the Saudi regime, when, when, when Bin Salman was here on campus, we never heard a word about that. There was never any statement accompanying you know, yeah, he was here, but we're aware of X and Y and Z. Yes, we're collaborating, but we're reaffirming MIT's non-discrimination policy. We're standing behind our LGBT community. We're standing behind, no, nothing. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's sort of shocking. It seems like we're forgetting about all of, all of that part. We're really just like researchers. We're not, you know, that, that human part, let's, let's leave that out. And maybe, um, maybe as a third point, it might be worth considering what do, what do we get out of it and what do they get out of it. Um, it seems like we're getting mostly money. Um, and I mean, MIT has money. We have, yeah. we have an endowment of $16 billion. MIT achieves incredible, like I'm getting 2% on my savings. MIT usually you know, gets 13, 14% of returns on its endowment. It's making a huge amount of money. So if it's just money we're getting, then we should think about, then, then, then the, the, the consideration should include where else could we take that money from to finance um, financial apps for Saudi students, to finance you know, and fund projects in the, in the energy research sector and all of those things. Um, because we have the money, so you know, it, that, that doesn't seem to be a, um, that can't be a strong argument for, for that collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a, a lot to discuss, and we have about uh, 20, 30 minutes, I guess. So uh, please uh, keep your questions or comments short. And uh, um, yeah. There's, there's two mics for, for the audience. Just, just line up. That's right. So I, I did. Well, I did state uh, that please keep your questions and comments, if they are comments, really brief, because we need to accommodate as many uh, people as possible. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, my name is Aziz Al Hassan. I'm a study student, PhD student here at MIT, and I worked before joining MIT in a government lab that's the equivalent of the National Science Foundation here in the US. And I saw a few uh, points in the discussions that I think need to be addressed is that abstracting Saudi Arabia and its political leadership is really a narrow way of looking at it. I know if we abstracted the National Science Foundation here in the US with it being the cur current political administration in the US, that would lead for the agency itself to function differently and really be tight on what it can and cannot do. So let's try more and look and break down Saudi Arabia to more than just a political climate. There are uh, public agencies, the National Science Foundation that I worked with in the past, there are people who work there and that's not, uh, Saudi Arabia is not Mohammed bin Salman personally or is not the political climate uh, per se. Um, so let's look at the word collaboration and what collaboration means. Uh, the collaboration means there is like people here at MIT who are working in research. Yes, it involves funding. And yes, it involves uh, what I think is most, more important is the people who are collaborating with MIT. So personally, I worked in research projects that were collaboration with MIT. Yes, money was part of it, but it's not the entire story. Abstracting it is in money and political capital is really narrow way of looking at it. I know that research has enabled me and enabled my colleagues to actually be more, let's say, socially open to change and changing from the ground up as opposed to top-down change, which we cannot really inflect by the structure that we function with. Uh, we have a pre-existing condition of being born in Saudi Arabia where we don't have the power of the First Amendment. So. Yes. Our only way of doing things is actually going through academia and doing research and cutting any collaboration. And that sense is really damaging, would inflict more damage than any nudging of the regime per se. So yes, cutting ties with Saudi Arabia as a political climate is a nudge in the right direction in the abstract sense, but at the same time, 
there's really severe consequences of isolating academics like myself in Saudi Arabia who are really eager to collaborate, who are really passionate about research, who are really willing to make change happen from within as opposed to just remain with lack of representation. So I think whenever assessing and evaluating the, co the relationship with Saudi Arabia that you remember that there are people who are like me sitting on their desk. It's not Mohammed bin Salman who's sitting on a desk and coding on a weekend to conduct research. It's researchers who are passionate, who want to make social change, who want to make things better, who want to inflict good as opposed to, uh, and I appreciate Sarah's argument of no harm done. Thank you. Thank so you. that's my comment. Thanks so much. Thank you. I think it's a very important point. Um, that we remember uh, clearly, I think all whole panel subscribes to the idea, I'm confident to say that, uh, you know, we do have to think about the no harm principle that in whatever way we respond, we don't end up doing more damage than good. And that we are nuanced in the way in which we respond. It's not a blunt argument for cutting off all relations, for example, and, and certainly continue to keep MIT as a place that remains an open place for people of all nationalities and faiths and and uh, and uh, backgrounds to come and work, including, of course, people from Saudi Arabia or any other country with which we may have a difficult moment at any given time. And there have been many such moments, as Jonathan reminded us. But I, I sense that this is actually a comment, so I'm not going to divert, I mean, to give this as a question to the panel. So maybe we can just take the next one, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Alice. Ooh, that was loud. Um, I work here at MIT, uh, and I'm on staff in the Open Learning Department, where we take a bunch of money from a Saudi corporation called Abdul Latif Jamal, um, which I don't think is great. But um, I'm also a member of a group here in Boston called Coalition to Stop the Genocide in Yemen. Um, and I think we call it that because I think it really is a genocide. Um, and I read the report this morning, um, which I think is one of the most kind of mealy-mouthed, weaselly apologies for what's going on in Yemen and what the Saudis and the UAE are doing there uh, that I've ever read. I mean, I'm serious. The war in Yemen in, in the report is described as kind of like a controversial conflict. If you read, if you follow what's been going on, what you see is a systematic policy they're carrying out. They're destroying hospitals. They're bombing schools. They're destroying the water infrastructure. There's about a million people who have cholera and 14 million people on the brink of starvation. Um, you know, I think when the British caused famines of millions of people in Bengal, in India, uh, they killed about three million people there in one of the biggest famines that they caused. I think that was a genocide, and I think if this is not stopped in Yemen, it's going to be a genocide too. Um, and I just, I really want to put that out there because I think if we really think that that's what's going on, that there's a genocide going on in the world, and that MIT is playing a role in whitewashing it, we have a serious responsibility as people, not just as MIT people who want to save the reputation of this university, but as people who have kind of any pro-people feeling. We have a really serious responsibility to do whatever is possible to end that. Um, and so my question to the panel is kind of, well, first of all, it'd be good maybe to talk about this report and <laughs> its many problems, not least of which not even, it doesn't mention actually how much money MIT takes from the Saudis. It just says, oh, 52% here, 48 something percent here. They don't even give a, a dollar amount, which is just incredibly dishonest. Um, but beyond that, I mean, what's our broader responsibility, not just to this, to this university and not to uh, the MIT community, but to the people of the world uh, to say, you know what, like, I will not stand by while a man-made famine kills 14 million people. That's entirely unacceptable. Um, thank you. Absolutely. Um, do any of you want to briefly respond to this question? <laughs> or maybe you know, we'll come back to it, because it's actually the large question that we're working with. What does one do, not just as a university, as academics, but also as individuals you know, concerned about uh, the cost of a conflict like uh, the one in Yemen? Um, the reality is also that uh, there is hardly any real publicly available data on a conflict like Yemen. It's not hard to find that information. It's fairly credible. The UN, for example, has been putting out repeatedly report after report. And I doubt that much of that information went into the assessment that informed decisions, not just by MIT, 
but by so many other universities that have accepted money from Saudi Arabia, do they really look at these reports? Do they consider human rights and humanitarian law violations as part of their due diligence or strategic calculations to engage in with the university, uh, with, uh, with countries? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. That's one of the reasons why we needed to have this panel. Thank you. This has been a great panel and great discussion. I wanted to bring one other point about the crimes of the Saudi regime into uh, focus, because many uh, already have been mentioned. But uh, the uh, sort of Arab Spring, the way that that spread through the Middle East, you know, in 2011 and 2012, it did take hold in Bahrain, and we have to remember that Saudi Arabia played a huge role in very violently putting down that movement within Bahrain. And Saudi Arabia has a, a role to play very much at the behest and with the green light uh, of the US um, to put down democratic revolutions throughout uh, the, the Gulf region and, and the Middle East. And so I think that when we talk about the principles that we want to uphold, if democracy is one of them, not only is Saudi Arabia not a democracy, but they proactively put down uh, democratic rebellions and so on, and I think that's very important here. Um, in addition, I did want to say that I think that if, if transparent, transparency is a very good first goal and something that we should strive for without doubt, but if transparency is not forthcoming, I don't think that that should hold the rest of us back in terms of not being s satisfied with the status quo of MIT relationships with Saudi Arabia because despite the fact that some good is being done, I don't think that anyone questions that if we get loads of money from Saudi Arabia that we can do good things with it, right? I mean, that's one of the things that Lester's report reiterates is, yes, good things have been done. The question is, at whose expense are these good things being done and are we actually, do we actually abide that? Are we actually okay with that? And I think that we have to reject that and it's certainly not just about who is coding at the weekend. I mean, with all due respect to the previous, you know, and, and absolutely, it is undoubtedly important what you, what you brought up, and uh, with all true due respect to that. It's not just about who's coding at the weekend, because MBS was here on campus, and there were only a couple of dozen people, if that, at, out front. I was one of them, okay? There were only a couple, there's thousands and thousands of people associated with this, with this campus, and very few actually protested MBS coming here. And MBS being here is a part of the PR that he has done. And the administration and corporate of this university are using that PR, which is lies, that he's some kind of progressive, uh, to basically hoodwink the rest of us and ameliorate our concerns into saying, no, 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 uh, everything's OK, good is being done, uh, status quo, status quo. Uh, yes, let's have a few panels and, and provost things here and there, and then we'll sweep it under the rug. And I think we have to reject that. We have to oppose this. Because this administration right now is the next gray administration that said no to divestment from apartheid in South Africa. And we have to not abide that. And we have to say, this is not OK. We understand what's happening with Yemen. We understand what's happening with global climate change. And we, don't, uh, we, we reject that. Thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the panel. Uh, I'm Richard, I'm, from the, I'm a PhD candidate from the math department. Uh, we have many members from the math department who uh, are collaborating with Saudi Aramco on a variety of numerical simulation projects. So the question is, if we were to uh, act upon uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, egregious um, uh, uh, human rights violations from uh, Saudi Arabia, how do we transition our own members from the MIT community to ensure a, a continuation of, of projects and funding because we're talking about PhD students whose tuition and stipend are potentially being covered by uh, companies with ties to the Saudi government. Thank you. Critical question. Would you like to? Um, uh, actually, to both uh, uh, contributions, I, I certainly agree with the early one. I mean, we have to make clear this guy is a military dictator of the worst kind. He's the defense minister. He's not a prince. He's a military dictator, right, doing very bad, bad things, right? There's no way we should have anything to do with it. With respect to your point, um, somebody talked about 
um, MIT's um, endowment. Uh, you know, a number of us are in a situation where we have to look very closely at the budget. There is plenty of money in the MIT budget to make sure that no student who's doing productive research has to stop their research because of the withdrawal of the Saudi money. And the administration has total authority over that pool of, of, of funds, right? They spend it, they hire PR people, they hired you know, armed guards to make sure that we couldn't get close to bin Salman when, 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 he, when he was here, right? So that's absolutely e easy to do. And you know, we, we do need to form some kind of, though uh, with respect to the young woman, yes, it's a, it's a local, national, Boston, Massachusetts thing, but we do have to have a committee at MIT that says we say no, and there's no reason that that shouldn't be one of our kind of asks that nobody who's doing legitimate research should lo lose out on it. We should use the institute funds for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir please. Uh, I'm Richard Krushnick. Uh, um, I attended uh, graduate school at MIT and studied city planning and uh, real estate development. Recently retired from the city of Boston's Department of Neighborhood Development and a volunteer working with uh, Massachusetts Peace Action and several of their task forces. I, I wish uh, <laughs> I could re uh, remember the exact name of this uh, research that had recently been done, maybe uh, Cole or somebody knows. Um, uh, it's a, a committee of experts that uh, worked through an international organization in Geneva on the, yeah, on demining. Um, anyway, um, uh, it's a fantastic report that was released this year, uh, fantastically footnoted and documented, and it lays out the war strategy that the Saudi Arabia and the United States government have been using uh, as a team in Yemen. And uh, the strategy from the very beginning in 2015, in the spring of 2015, has been, uh, since the Saudis have not done very well on the ground combating uh, Houthi soldiers and so on, uh, really what's been going on is a strategy explicitly designed from the very beginning uh, to create a mass disease and mass starvation. The targets, the primary targets of the bombing are not military targets. There, as the young woman recently indicated, there are a lot of civilian targets. Uh, for example, one of the first targets was the uh, son of the capital's um, electrical grid, which a consequence of which was immediately shutting down the water treatment plant. Uh, and then the subsequent uh, naval blockade made it impossible to import chlorine. Uh, that's what gave us the cholera epidemic, right? No pure water and no means to purify the water. In the first six months, uh, this uh, study documented uh, around 400, uh, and of course there are undoubtedly many more attacks, all, all, by the way, of course, with U.S. planes, U.S. bombs, and U.S. refueling to make sure the planes could get to their targets. The targets were primarily farms, herds of livestock, you know, the water system all over the country, the irrigation system that irrigates the fields and provides water to the livestock. As uh, this young woman said, it also included the water treatment plant, the hospitals, you know, and so on and so forth. So th the warfare strategy from the very beginning has been a strategy fundamentally designed to create mass starvation and disease. And we are now seeing the fruits of that strategy in the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are starving to death and dying from cholera. Thank you. I think, you know, this also highlights the extraordinary lack of public understanding when it comes to remote conflicts like Yemen, which are not in the public, you know, limelight. And people just discover only because of the death of Jamal Khashoggi, all this issue has actually popped up. 
Otherwise, uh, there are so many like this over the years that one can actually think of. So uh, please, uh, let's have your question. I think we can take another one question after that. I have to step out. And Jonathan, okay. So let's just have your question. Hi, I'm on. Uh, we're, we're no. There's an electronic sign up, but we're gonna pass around an old fashioned hand sign up for people who want to be informed, what's the next, you know, do we have some next activity or keep you, keep you in, in touch? So please write down, do both. Sign up on the manual one and electronically. Great. Yeah. Hi, I'm a, I'm a junior here studying uh, mathematics. So we've talked a lot about um, the horrors of the Yemen war, uh, the horrors of the repression inside of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we've talked about um, the, the activities of the Saudi government being antithetical to the way, you know, to, to, to the ethos of this place, to the way we conduct ourselves, to the values that are sort of inherent in, in how we do our day-to-day -day business here. Um, but I want to push back against the idea that, that uh, collaborating with Saudi Arabia is actually against the, the values of MIT when MIT is understood as the MIT corporation and the MIT administration and this institutional level. Um, I mean, it, it you know, uh, as, a, as students, you know, certainly we, we conduct ourselves in this very liberal way and, and, and these things matter. Uh, but when you're, you know, President Rafe or, or uh, Richard K. Lester, uh, what matters is a very cold, you know, cost-benefit analysis, right? Um, uh, and from that perspective, it's actually perfectly rational for, for, for them to continue these, these activities. Because, well, I mean, clearly n nobody cares enough to, to make it uh, uh, a threat to their reputation. Uh, we don't do anything about it. Uh, uh, MIT has been pr perfectly fine uh, in terms of reputation-wise. And, you know, these collaborations do bring in um, maybe some money and, well, who knows exactly what. I mean, uh, because there is no transparency, we don't know the full details of, <laughs> of, how, of how deep this stuff goes. But, I mean, like, just, uh, just from the little we know, I mean, Saudi Aramco is a, is a founding member of the MIT Energy Initiative along with, um, what, BP and, and Shell and, and the like. Um, um, so, so, like, it, 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 there is no r reason to think that, like, that the MIT Corporation should change what it's doing. Uh, and if those of us, you know, who, who, who still have some uh, humanness in us care uh, uh, about these sorts of things. Um, the only way that any change is going to happen is if we make it, uh, 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 we make it uh, uh, dangerous for the administration to continue. If we threaten the reputation by be by 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 putting pressure, um, uh, because otherwise it's completely rational. It's completely within reason for them to continue these these these. Uh, um, Collaboration. There is nothing in uh, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, baloney liberal internationalism that 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 our great institutions uh, espouse that is actually incompatible uh, with millions of people dying uh, and with uh, 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 repression as long as it doesn't, you know, happen here. Um, that's that's my point. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Well said. Can I, just, uh, can I just say a word on, yes. on that? If you have any doubts that this is not the right regime to make such a, um, take such an action, then you have to ask yourself, what type of regime would meet your criteria? Which, which conditions would raise to the level that you would say, oh no, we, we have to isolate them. Because, and, it, and if you're a student receiving money from Saudi Arabia, I can understand you're in a conflicted situation. Uh, but you have to understand that they're giving MIT money for legitimation. They want to be legitimate. When my colleague at the medical school came to me and said, I have a problem. Uh, I, I didn't get my NIH funding. Uh, the only way I'll be able to run the lab is to get money from Philip Morris. Uh, I said, well, 
You have to do a few things if you want to take this money. Uh, but I found out, you know, one of the things was ask them why you want to fund your research because his research was about chemicals and how they endanger our lives. And I found out later on the reason why they wanted to fund his research is that when they're cross-examined in the many litigation cases, they're often asked, do you fund any legitimate science? And they wanted at least one example to use to legitimate their, uh, their answers to that question. On the right. Hi, um, my name is Chance. I'm an undergrad at Boston University, and I'm also a member of the Coalition to Stop the Genocide in Yemen. Um, first, I just want to reiterate what the last person had said, that we really do have to take action on our own campuses, not just here at MIT and at Harvard, but also at BU, uh, Northeastern, Tufts. All of these campuses have different ties to these regimes. We really have to take action to divest from them. And I, I, I want to push back a little bit against something that was said on the panel, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember who said it, um, that this is only about the regime and not about private business interests in Saudi Arabia or the UAE. Um, I think it, it, there, obviously there is a distinction between the Saudi people, the Emirati people, and the regimes and the business interests there. But the business interests are part of that establishment that is, has an interest in waging that war in Yemen. <coughs> they, uh, for example, Boston University uh, has one big trustee donor, Rajan Kilachand, who recently donated like 100 million, over $100 million to the university. And he runs this conglomerate that profits immensely from a lot of things, but oil as well. And that's one of the main reasons that the Yemen war is so uh, profitable for Aramco and other institutions like that. Um, so I think in criticizing MIT's ties and other universities' ties, and in building a divestment movement on our campuses and throughout uh, and in the larger anti-war movement against the war in Yemen, we really do have to be cognizant of the fact that it's not just the regime, but it's also the businesses that are supportive of the regime. So. Thank you. So um, I guess my, I guess this is just sort of a question out to the panel. I don't know how much, I assume you've had probably more I guess, bandwidth and more knowledge in general of MIT's involvement with Saudi Arabia as a whole than someone who, like me, really only dug a little deeper in after the report this morning. But the overwhelming impression that sort of came out of the report was, one, it seemed very rushed and I'm trying to find very half, um, <laughs> half-assed, if, if you don't mind the crassness. Half-baked, thank you. Um, but overall, um, it seemed to one lack information in terms of the actual cost. And it's hard to imagine that it was the timing of the report release was particularly well thought out, <laughs> given that it does seem that since you have received uh, calls from the media um, as of today, people have not failed to notice the timing. I guess the question is what sort of it is a complex issue. There is legitimate good being done, not in terms of this nebulous research fund eventually does good, which doesn't sound very convincing, but in terms of things like enabling people to advocate for themselves in Saudi Arabia, like enabling people to actually build their own narratives within there um, in a way that science can be very empowering to do. There is a legitimate cost-benefit analysis, both in terms of what MIT can do through the funding but also what MIT can do as a name in terms of advocating against arms sales, in terms of advocating for other major universities to, if not necessarily divest their interests, but how to shape their relationships with Saudi Arabia in a way that does not do harm. I mean, it seems like, to some extent, the biggest disappointment of the report wasn't just the recommendation that it came to, but the lack of a really meaningful analysis of what it means for MIT to be involved in this transaction, what is the real harm being done, what is the real good being done, not some sort of PRE mashup of research money does good eventually, and how can we as a community, one, in terms of how can we wrestle with our involvement and understand it, 
but also how can we push people to do more to acknowledge the harm, like the good and the harm that can be done in these transactions? And I guess the question to the panel is, how do we sort of advocate for or do that legwork ourselves in terms of getting that information that we need to make those determinations and advocating for the conclusions that we do reach? Thank you. Uh, well, let me take a crack at this. Uh, first, you're right about the report. Almost certainly it was released today because this is the pers first public forum uh, on, the, on the campus and we have substantial uh, speakers here and they knew there was going to be an audience. This is not a report of a committee. It's not a report of any standing committee of MIT. It's a report from, it's not even a report. It's a draft letter from one individual who refers to anonymous other faculty who take part, right? Makes no, you know, doesn't deal with the issue of, of lemon. It is a, a whitewash, and it doesn't have in it all the information that many of us were led to believe, right? What is the actual contract, right? How much money is it? Now, the notion that a university can leverage a dictatorship, right? There's no example in history, right, where it was possible to do that. It's just the opposite. They hold all the levers. They say, if you insist on a stat of funding an independent journalist group in our country, we'll cut off your Aramco money. I mean, so the MIT administration is, is they're using their leverage to prop up the regime to get, to get, to get the money. W what you are asking for is not going to come from the administration. We might call for that uh, f from below. But I think that's un, uh, uh, unrealistic. These relationships are not, uh, as Shelley said, private corporation, private university, co its corporation with um, a, a dictator, an absolute monarchy. Th there's no democracy in there. Th there's no mechanism for doing, doing the, 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 the right thing. What we should do, we should divest, right? That then gives you the freedom of, of pushing for sending a delegation there to interview the women and find out what's actually going, go, going on because they can't say, we'll cut off your money if we st stop you. Um, in terms of getting more information in the report, I don't think that's going to happen unless uh, you know, some ad hoc committee gets itself together and demands and say, you know, what's in that con uh, uh, c contract? And you know, how much money was it for? And what are, what are the terms? Um, and you know, though that, some, um, that photograph of Raphael Reif, the president of MIT, shaking hands with Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudis sent that around the world. They sent it around, around the, the, the world, right? And so it's not neutral, right? It's you're on one side, which side are you on? When the battle lines form, you can't say, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, I'm going to stay in the middle. No, you can't stay in the mi middle once the concentration camps have been opened. You've got to take a stand. And so, you know, some people are going to get hurt. Some people's research projects are going to get uh, cut off. People working on, you know, low yield coal burning uh, on an Aramco uh, thing. Uh, one, one last thing, I'm sorry that I'm uh, hogging the microphone. Some of these contracts, I, you know, a reporter called me up. Uh, and said that they found out that one of the contracts was for pyrolyzing methane, which is, you talk about burning methane at very high temperatures. And he asked me, well, what is that about? Well, I don't know what that's about. Maybe, who knows? But one place where you burn methane at high temperature is in a missile engine, in a rocket engine. And I immediately thought, oh, you know, they're trying to build up a defense industry uh, in Saudi Arabia, that's clear. They have contracts with Raytheon to send Raytheon people over. What are they going to get from MIT? They're going to get some people trained in the support apparatus for the weapons uh, industry. Is it going to say that on the contract? No. Just like the old iLab contracts saying uh, to the mathematics department, with the mathematics of an elongated object passing through a dilute fluid, right? It wasn't about missile guidance. No, 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 no. It's basic mathematics. So. Uh, as long as they don't release more of the details, it's very hard to know that, that these are do no harm. Sorry. Ma'am. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank you all for this very uh, 
relaxed Q&A session because I think everyone has had a lot of valuable things to say, so thank you. Um, my name's Anna, and I'm a BU graduate uh, last year, and I'm now involved with Mass Peace Action, as a couple of other people are too, and partnering with the uh, No Genocide in Yemen. Um, and I wanted to touch on what the first question asker from Saudi Arabia um, talked about because it was a really interesting perspective um, that made me kind of think back to South Africa divestment and how some arguments against divestment were made saying, you know, divestment isn't gonna hurt the regime, it's gonna hurt the people, we shouldn't divest, we're going to be starving the people that are being oppressed. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are and if you could expand on this balance that would be sought and sought to achieve with uh, ensuring collaboration and you know um, collaboration with deserving academics, but also distancing MIT from Saudi Arabia. I'm just wondering your thoughts. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia has a very odd economy, right? There's not a great big manufacturing base with thousands of people stitching. Uh, T-shirts as there is in Bangladesh or you know in, in Vietnam, it's an oil-based economy. Most members of the royal family don't work, in any real real sense. Uh, you know, if you had a big domestic industry, you could put in some constraints about no sweatshops, fa fairness, etc. But as far as we know, uh, and this is partly because maybe ignorance, most of what goes on there is either the military apparatus to you know, get rid of the Arab Spring motion in Bahrain or to bomb the Yemenis or to get rid of the food supply in Yemen and the oil and the petroleum indus industry. So it's not clear to me who are the poor people of Saudi Arabia that, that are gonna get <laughs> hurt by this. But we do know that the poor people of Yemen are getting hurt right, right, right now. So I, I'd say that y your point that that argument that if we cut off relations with Saudi Arabia, we're doing some damage. Yeah, some people will, will lose, all the middlemen will lose. But compared to what they're doing in Yemen, uh, I think there's no, that, that calculus is, is, is clear. It's like World War, you know, I keep on thinking about World, World War II. You know, Ford was gonna sell trucks to the Nazis, right? And it was only because of, you know, uprising from below that it got, Got, got stopped, wasn't against the law, we hadn't declared war. Yes, here, take the mic. I mean, maybe, <coughs> sorry, maybe something that would help is to get a real report in which we then know how many students are financed through the Saudi government, how much, how much tuition is paid for them, how many are helped to come here, and what would it cost MIT to, to find those funds somewhere else? What's the marginal cost to us, right? If we, we want to get the regime out, we, keep, we want to keep the students here, what's, what's that going to cost us, and can we get the money somewhere else? And if we knew that, then we could have a discussion about that, right? Just a side note, it's not about the money. If it wasn't for our collaboration, I wouldn't be a qualified scientist to even apply to MIT. It's the infrastructure of science getting to the country as opposed to just money. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. It's not about money specifically, it's about building the infrastructure in Saudi Arabia for science like me to get qualified to even apply through the doors of MIT. If I just went through undergrad by itself, that wouldn't be sufficient to build a, a qualified MIT applicant. So it's definitely not money only, it's not related to that even. So it's way wider and broader than just the money for Saudi students or just money being thrown into research project just because I know for a fact that this money that comes from any Saudi source is a really small fraction of whatever money that gets MIT gets in general. I just have a quick clarifying question. So is, is MIT sponsoring in science infrastructure in Saudi Arabia? It seems like that's what you're saying. I just wanted to be clear. So the collaboration involves um, PIs here at MIT and then funding, of course, to fund grad students in general. But at the same time, those teams work and people on the ground in Saudi Arabia like me and other researchers who actually uh, have really minimal mentoring, if it's not uh, for those collaborations. We work 
and healthcare we work, work and urban planning myself we work and energy, clean energy, water desalination, a few isolate the Saudi uh, academic community from those collaborations, I think it would starve in a way and wouldn't mature to support itself to build research in areas that basic human needs are needed to. Uh, yeah, for instance, I worked in projects with PIs here at MIT on uh, undergrad water ut utilization and priorita prioritizing crops, which crops to go on. If it wasn't for the mentorship that came through the project, if it wasn't for the collaboration that gave me the chance to, be, to get exposed to uh, cutting edge science in general and like uh, high quality mentorship, that research wouldn't have been done and then me and my colleagues wouldn't have been given the chance to apply for grad schools in the US and elsewhere to get into top tier places, MIT being one of them. If that wasn't the collaboration infrastructure being there, I think uh, people like me wouldn't have the high quality, uh, I'd say mentorship programs in general to get into a high cutting edge academic community. So it's not abstracting it to money that's being given to the institute is really poor, small portion of the story. It's not even that. Um, I'll just hold it. I'm, I'm Roger Levy, uh, faculty in brain and cognitive science. I really appreciate um, this panel and I appreciate all of the thoughtful remarks that have been made. Um, uh, to, to build on these, uh, these remarks, you know, um, I, I, I think um, I read the report uh, from Richard Lester very carefully this morning and I've been rereading it sort of before and during this panel. And although I, I see many imperfections in it um, and it's certainly not the way that I would have structured a report if I were in charge of this, I also read it and, uh, and, and Reif's, um, President Reif's uh, call for the report and message to the MIT community a month and a half ago as something that we should in some sense take as a glimmer of hope and opportunity. And I think it's of course, um, it reflects the fact that um, all of the, the ongoing um, war in Yemen and many of the other repressive ongoing actions of the regime are things that are terrible. Of course, uh, uh, there, are, there are also other regimes in the world that, uh, that the US and MIT and other institutions in our country and in, the, and in uh, democracies are engaged with in ways that we wouldn't want them to be necessarily. But it, it's just to go back to the, 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 the spark that led to all of this is that the assassination of Khashoggi in Istanbul um, on in international territory, a, a prominent critic of the uh, of the government is is actually a new uh, that that is a new level of horror, and not just for the particularities of the event, but the precedent that it potentially sets for violence against journalists by other regimes um, around the country, and uh, you know concerns actually that I share about um, what might happen in this country as well, um, given the kind of rhetoric that we see. Um, the reason I say this is that I actually think um, we shouldn't take a purely pessimistic view of the report and of the ongoing solicitation of comments. Um, and I, I would urge everybody to read the report carefully and to t make use of the of the opportunity to comment on it through that, through the, the venue, the, through the means that the report states, but also through any other avenues that you have. Um, to give commentary to the MIT administration. And I wanna give one example of a, a kind of um, suggestion that I think that um, emerges from today's discussion that I think actually there might, this might be really a reasonable thing to push for. So I wanna emphasize Jonathan's point that, um, so there was a reasonable concern raised about the, uh, what would happen to uh, the funding for students involved in Saudi projects. And that is a very legitimate concern. One of the complexities involved in a situation like this is that in fact um, the autonomy of MIT faculty members, of university faculty members to use their own judgment about what, uh, what, what kinds of projects to be engaged in is a very important thing that I, I feel very exquisitely sensitive to because actually it's individuals who have sustained relationships and so forth that may be in the best position to make judgments about what kind of engagements are likely to be productive and actually helpful to societies that we would like to see change and what kind of engagements aren't. And so what I'm asking myself is, well, what can we do as, what can the, institu in the Institute do to create favorable conditions for faculty to make 
judgments that, and, and take actions that are consistent with their values and with institute values and with, with values that I think we hold, hold in our community. So, for example, one particular thing that's noted in the report is um, that, that Lester himself says, if principal investigators who are leading projects concludes that they don't want to continue to do that, sorry, Saudi-funded projects, conclude that they don't want to do so in light of recent events, then the institute should work with them to minimize the resulting disrup disruption to the research and to affected personnel, including, most importantly, our students. And I think we should capitalize on this thing, absolutely. The institute should very publicly make available funds and announce that any faculty member who is carrying on a Saudi-funded project has access, has recourse, if they are uncomfortable with continuing that project, they have recourses. It should be easier for them to actually take actions that are consistent with the val their values. And the Institute should make that announcement very public. And that would be something that, in my view, is, uh, you know, would, would actually be a constructive response. It would, be res uh, it would be responsive to the present moment as well as to the longer history. And it's actually something that, uh, you know, that we don't know what the response might be, but it's something constructive that, we, uh, that I read the report as suggesting might be something useful to push for. So anyway, I, I would also value your take uh, collectively as panel members on whether that seems like the right kind of initiative or what other kind of engagements that we can make with the administration that have high likelihood of MIT being able to come out and make a public stance, continuing to actually the, the, the baby steps that it's taking. What, what can we do to help facilitate that? Since we have people been standing in line, thank you. I'm not going to answer that immediately. It's a, on a, it's a on good proposal, of ongoing consideration. I'd like those who've been standing online to have the last call, and then we'll get, we will formally, after the people who are standing have spoke, we will adjourn. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Nina Litton. I'm with the Humanist Chaplaincy here at MIT, and I wanted to thank Radius and all the participants and the student activists and say, I, I know, I feel how long and hard this can be for you. I think there are some lessons that students can learn, perhaps by getting together with the people still on campus who were w organized the fossil-free MIT activities, which resulted in significant discussion. You know, it might be well remembered for f a four-month sit-in, but it, it did generate quite a lot of discussion behind the scenes uh, of the type of learning and practical approaches that, that were explored is, is left a good legacy. And so maybe there's some expertise that, that you all can take advantage of. Thank you. No, I agree that fossil free uh, MIT battle is an important, you know, we should, we should learn from that. Hi, I'm Sally Haslinger. I was supposed to chair the session, but I broke my jaw. So, um, but I, I can't keep my mouth shut. Um, <laughs> So I just wanted to make a point that, um, so if you can't understand me, I apologize. Um, I find that at MIT in general, I'm in philosophy, I do ethics as a profession, that there's this tendency to be very reductionist about reasoning. And the idea is that rationality is all about uh, expected utility and that, that it's all cost-benefit analysis. But none of you lead your lives according to cost-benefit analyses. That's not how morality works, and that's not the morality. I mean, they purport to give cost-benefit analyses and things like this, but there are, are principles and values to uphold human rights that aren't about cost-benefit. We don't say when someone's rights are being violated, oh, is it gonna cost me too much to, to sort of save the person's life or to prevent genocide or things like this. It is really a mistake to think that everything runs on cost-benefit analysis. And when we make the argument to the administration, and when we make the argument to the press, and we make arguments, don't assume that that's the only arguments that are available or that's the only arguments that people will listen to because there are important moral considerations here beyond cost-benefit analysis. Thank you. All right, why don't we close with uh, Cole Harrison, who's the Executive Director of Massachusetts Peace Action. Oh. Oh yeah. Amen to the last. Amen to the last speaker. I'll be very brief, but just again, there's it's an urgent situation. They're saying that a child is dying in Yemen every 10 minutes. It is the world's worst humanitarian crisis, according to the United Nations. So all of the pros and cons, let's let's deal with them promptly. 
Second of all, um, pressure works. There was this student that called for pressure. Well, the Senate passed, took a vote seven, eight days ago, and today in the paper we read that negotiations to end the Yemen war uh, are moving forward. It's very cautious, and th it is going to be a difficult negotiation. This war has been going on for almost four years. Within a month after the war started, Human Rights Watch was calling out saying, this is not looking good. And so this, this controversy has been going on for a long time. But the international community, the United States, and the Western governments have not paid attention to doing it. And suddenly, when the Senate takes a vote, there, there's a negotiation that, that begins to happen. So we're, it's going to take a lot more pressure to end this war. It's going to take a lot more pressure before the United States even ends its involvement in the war. But if there's something MIT can do in the near term, it should think about doing that. And then the last thing I wanted to say is uh, Richard Krushnick that spoke about that report that came out of Tufts pointing out that the Saudi war strategy is deliberately to destroy the civilian infrastructure of Yemen. He didn't remember the reference. It's by Martha Mundy. The title is Strategies of the Coalition in the Yemen War, and it's published by the World Peace Foundation at the Tufts Fletcher School. Okay, thank you. Use the mic. Very briefly, thank you. Um, my name is Griff Peterson. I've been working with my colleagues Yarda and Katz, Caitlin Olson, and more recently Chance and a whole a bunch of other folks to develop a sort of community uh, community focused approach to sort of taking action outside of an individual institution, outside of the government of the United States. Um, so we've been meeting now, we're a group of people from Harvard, MIT, BU, BC, Cambridge City Council, some activists, students, faculty, and our hope is to uh, run a public workshop in early 19 to basically roll out an alternative process. Like someone said earlier, we don't need all the information before we do something publicly, and I think we want to use the sort of slow trickle of information to our uh, advantage and say basically, you know, universities need to reckon with the with the with the um, the pain and the suffering that they've already caused by legitimizing certain governments. They need to disclose the scope of these relationships so that um, you know people beyond just faculty can actually. Um, you know, make a decision about what they think, and then we need to sort of repair what's broken by formulating a more collective response. So we're going to be using uh, university Boston area relationships with universe with a uh, Boston University, not Boston University, Boston area colleges and schools relationships with uh, Saudi and the Emirates in uh, as sort of an example to try this new community partnership. Um, so I really would encourage everyone to take one of these flyers while we're compiling a reading list and we have a mailing list and everyone is welcome to participate in this. So, so thank you. So all of you here, please do sign up uh, manually and electronically. Uh, I guarantee you that we will try to keep you informed, do some kind of follow-up thing on the campus, connect with these groups, take their lead, be the caboose on, on their uh, engine. Uh, I would call your attention to the fact that it may not seem to you that the editorial board of the MIT faculty newsletter or the radius technology and culture forum of the Episcopal Diocese is the leading edge of political change at MIT. But at MIT, we are the, uh, the groups that have been able to act uh, independently of the administration. So open your emails that come from us and don't immediately tr trash them. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm so sorry to drag this on, but um, we are hosting an event on Monday. If you're interested, um, it's about US-Saudi relations and Yemen. Uh, and we have flyers over here. We're going to be joined by Stephen Kinzer, who's a Boston Globe journalist and a professor at Brown for International Relations. So we would really love to see you all here, or there. <laughs>